Good morning, church. I'm Pastor Tracy Cox of First United Methodist Church of Pittsburgh, and today we begin our worship time together at the altar that is in the sanctuary, adorned with Lenten imagery and and, um, some of our remembrances of when we've gathered together. So I invite you to come on into worship, open your hearts and your minds, chat along in the chat room, make your introductions to someone, maybe ask a question about what's happening. And remember, it has been almost a year that we have been distanced from one another while we worship from our homes and and from our kitchen tables and from our spaces that are separate from one another. And I'd li- I, I would encourage you and invite you to think upon that and to be reassured how God has held us together, that we have entered into Lent with hope and with strength and with the ability to hold on to God together so that we can worship. Glad you're here. It is good that we're together.
Do you have any idea where I am now? What position and what's above me? Well, I'm underneath the memorial garden. And the curved wall that you probably can't see back there is um, standing strong and faithful in the corner there. When I think of Lent, and I think of that clay that was chosen by God by the potter's hands, and I think when the work needs to begin to create and to form, there's a centering that has to happen. And how beautiful Lent invites us to be centered. So I invite you to come and, and to begin to feel God's hands center you and work you to make sure that it's going to be okay. That the hands of God begin to pull you in close together so that you're not frayed and that you're not sporadic and, and feel filled with chaos. And sometimes as that centering begins and continues, there is a break. There is a collapse that happens. But God gently, gently moves her hands and says, no, it's okay. It's okay. And the centering begins all over again. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. When I think of Lent, I think of the Almighty centering me, centering the church, no matter where we are, no matter where we find ourselves in the ruins, we are being centered. With honesty and courage, God calls us to take account of evil and injustice. To consider it in community to reflect in silence, to pay attention in public. The love of God makes known our transgressions, not for shame nor for guilt, but for deliverance and freedom. Mercy comes to take our hand. The way of salvation is set before us. Thanks be to God, our Redeemer and friend.
Good morning, kids. Welcome to family time. I'm so glad that you're here today. Let's start with our prayer of gratitude. Lord, thank you for all we are given, especially the love in the hearts of many. For sun, moon, stars, and sky. Family, friends, friends, and and fun. And most of all, for the opportunity to help those in need. Amen. So today is the second Sunday in Lent. Remember, Lent is that time of year where we're preparing to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and we're journeying with Jesus on his way to the cross. And we're learning what it means to live into that pattern of dying to old ways and old habits that we have and being raised to the new life and new things that God has for us. And during Lent, we're talking about all these symbols that we use in the church to celebrate Lent, to observe Lent. The symbol that I want to talk about today is actually just a color. I don't know if you've noticed, but around church, when we're gathered here together, uh, you can look around the sanctuary and notice that many of the colors that you see change throughout the year, depending on the church season that we're in. So during the season of Lent, you'll often see the color purple. I brought a few things. Uh, This is a stole that Pastor Tracy sometimes wears during Lent. Uh, Her father-in-law gave it to her. You know, a stole is something that a pastor wears around their neck like this. Hangs down as they're preaching. And this one is purple and it has some nice pins on it. Uh, And so it's one that she would wear during Lent. And here is something called a paramount. It's something that we put over the altar table or over the pulpit maybe. And you can see it has these nice beads on it. And it's a beautiful purple, light purple color. So what do you think of? Oops, what do you think of when you think of the color purple? Maybe you think of Barney, the big purple dinosaur. He's kind of old. You probably don't know him. A lot of people, when they think of purple, think of royalty, kings and queens, princes and princesses. And that's part of what we think about in Lent uh, when when we think about the color purple. We think about Christ as the king of the whole world, the king of our hearts. And also, um, we think about this story. When Jesus is being sentenced to death on the cross, some of the soldiers who are handling him and taking him there start to make fun of him because people have been claiming that he is the king. And they say, what kind of king is this? And they wrap a purple garment around him, just like a king would wear, and they laugh at him, spit on him. So the purple of Lent not only reminds us of Jesus's being a king, it also reminds us of the sadness of Lent, of mourning. We mourn during this time for the sadness of Jesus' humiliation and death, but also the humiliation and and the deaths of many people in our world today who are beaten and betrayed and mocked and killed by the powers of this world, by young black men and women who are um, killed by law enforcement officers sometimes, by... uh, gay and lesbian and transgender friends who are excluded from the church and from other places of worship sometimes, 
or even people in our own lives, people who we might exclude from our circle of friends. The Purple of Lent reminds us that people get hurt by other people who have power and authority and influence, and that we mourn with them, and that Jesus mourns with them and joins them in his suffering. And it's that, that kind of joining with those who are excluded and in pain, that we see Jesus' real vocation as king. This is what it looks like when God rules. It looks like Jesus eating meals with people that nobody else wants to eat meals with. It looks like Jesus healing people who are hurting and excluded. It looks like Jesus dying on the cross in solidarity with other people who have died and been in pain by exclusion from others. That's what it means for God to be king, for God to be in charge of the world and of our hearts. And so I hope that you know wherever you find yourself today, maybe maybe you're a person in your life who's done some excluding, who's, who's left people out. And so Lent is a time that you can begin to make some changes in your life, right? Begin to think about what it means to be inclusive, to invite people in. Maybe you're a person who's been excluded, who's been left out. Wherever you find yourself, I hope you know that God is there with you, right where you are. So Tim, here we are. It's the last Sunday of February of Black History Month, and you and I had a conversation the first Sunday of this month, um, about what it means to honor the black musical tradition in our church, uh, and the diversity of it beyond just the spirituals that so often get sung and about the difficulty of that, uh, in this particular medium doing worship online, uh, and, you know, just some of the struggles that we have gone through as a community trying to figure that out and our commitment to um, doing better. So just wondering, how's that going? What's, is there an update on where we are? Uh, not really an update per se. Um, I, I think it's funny that I, we talked about that. And then um, the next couple of weeks right after that, <laughs> I loaded the spirituals into our worship. Um, but, you know, it doesn't discount spirituals. Uh, you know, the, the thematic material in those uh, matched what we were doing as a through line. And uh, last week in particular, I want Jesus to walk with me. Um, you know, it wouldn't let me go even after starting to work on it. And so I think there's power in, in all of that. Um, you know, the, the organ prelude today uh, was written by a female black composer um, in the 50s, which is an unusual, uh, an unusual thing for this country. Um, Florence Price. And, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, I, uh, this brings up another, another thing I discovered. Uh, so this piece was public domain uh, when I found it. And, you know, in thinking about that, it probably shouldn't be. Um, so I, I really struggled with what does that mean uh, to find a piece that you like and, and good representation, and yet it's public domain. Um, how do you compensate for that? How do you, you know, find a way to support for that? And, um, you know, one of the things that I think the church can do and I can do personally is every time we come into that situation, uh, find a way to support what you're doing. And so I, I looked around for some foundations to help support young black composers, um, possibly young black female composers to kind of go along with that theme. Um, I was able to find one in the uh, Rachel Barton Pine Foundation. Uh, it, it's uh, something that we can do as a church, uh, something that I would hope the church would help hold me accountable as I'm presenting music in, you know, is it free? Was it on public domain? Um, should it have been? How can we, you know, further progress, you know, create progress in our own community, uh, starting with my choices, but then our response to that choice. And we've also uh, purchased some additional copyright, right, to play music that's more diverse uh, in our online offerings. That is true. Um, I did seek out a new um, 
like copyright and streaming and mechanical license service uh, to help us provide more music for our online worship. Um, you know, the new one, while it, it doesn't mean we can get rid of the old one, the new one has a wider variety of a representation uh, tr of people of color and truly is a much broader spectrum of the music we actually use here at the church. So I'm excited about choosing music in the future because of that. Yeah, that's cool. It's a it's a continuing process that we're learning and changing and growing even in our own um, ability to, to offer a vision of, of the kingdom of God in all its diversity. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. When people talk about their spirituality, they often use words like, I feel grounded or centered. We may talk of journeying into ourselves. So imagine how images like that might feel in your body, your feet planted on the ground, your center of gravity lowers a little bit, and you come into yourself. And then think about what happens when life just comes at you like a ton of bricks and you don't know what to do, right? How does that feel in your body? For me, it's like up on your toes and stretch out wide, right? And you're big and ah. So how might we embody that movement from big and wide and up on your toes and off balance to down into your center, there's a, a movement that comes to us from Kokyuho, which is like a Japanese version of Tai Chi that I think embodies this movement where you come up wide and then down in. And so, of course, in the, that first movement, we're experiencing the world, bringing in everything that we find around us. So we breathe in. And then when you come down, you're moving into that void, into the negative space. So you breathe out. So up and in. And down. Now that's a kind of a big movement, and maybe you're not as comfortable moving uh, in such a big space, so maybe you can go a bit smaller and just circle your arms. Maybe you even want to remain seated, and that's fine too. Uh, you can have the same motion where you come out like you're at loose ends, and then down, sinking down into your center. Out and down into your center. So let's just try that together a few times as we embody this movement from out and off kilter and off balance to sinking down and finding that center place, that grounded place inside of ourselves. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, 
but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Would you pray with me, please? God with us, incarnate one. In so many ways, we have learned to minimize our potential as individuals, a community, as people of faith. Letting others define our worth and capabilities, we deny our power. May your presence among us awaken and enliven all that you have envisioned for us, that we may be faithful to you and the generations to come. Amen and amen. Well, we continue on in our invitation to Lent. The potter has lovingly, gently invited us to prepare our hearts, our lives, our communities for the joy of our salvation, to prepare for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are so many steps to be taken as we journey through Lent together. This week two of Lent, the potter continues to in to the invitation to for us to be centered on our journey, to be centered where we are in the midst of brokenness and in the midst of the ruins that surround us. We are invited to become aware of where we have been, where we stand, and where we can go. And the scripture today challenges us to remember that this Lenten journey is fueled by faith, not by the works of our hands or even the work of the steps of our feet. We remember, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is God's gift to you, not the result of works that anyone should boast. Shared in the wonderful text from Romans is the thought of the inclusion into the life of God that we have been offered, the inclusion of God into the places where we live life together. Our story declares how God made covenant through Abraham with the Jewish people. Laws and rituals and expectations of love and justice framed this life together. And Abraham became the father of many nations. Remember, as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. 
And long after Abraham was on the mountain, the Gentiles entered the story. And the Gentiles did not follow this traditional path of conversion. And it's through the Apostle Paul, the writer of Romans, that we learn that Gentiles, who were not raised within the Jewish faith community, that these folks became, and, and because of faith, could be reconciled to God. When the word Gentile is used, it can be difficult to place ourselves in the story, but there we are. There we are. We can be reconciled to God, not through conversion, but through the transformation in Christ and become part of the story. To this day, we can be one with God. And this is the seismic tweak in our story. Abraham's lineage is not thrown out or discounted or forgotten about because when God makes a covenant, the covenant is true and God is faithful. But with this seismic twist, God, God widens the circle of how communities live life together. Communities that have different histories and, and different rituals and, and power structures and political systems they all come together with God to live life through love and through justice. And I wonder, I wonder if this Lent, this almost year long into a, a global pandemic where we are physically distanced from one another and socially isolated, I wonder if there is another seismic tweak that is upon us in this Lent. Look at what we have to consider. Look and listen to the steps that we must take together. Our LGBTQIA plus siblings continue to be marginalized and cast out from our churches. Where's the seismic tweak that is needed to put that on a course with love and justice? Consider that white supremacy and systemic racism and white privilege has cast an oppressive shadow over politics and the very nature of our judicial system and the institutions that we use to frame our communities. Where is the seismic tweak that we can usher in so that justice prevails? Think about the access to vaccines and to health care, yet alone affordable health care, how that is deprived for many who have low incomes or do not have a job. Where is the seismic tweak that we can guide and know that it is true that all deserve health care? And what about climate change? and the care for this earth that we live on and with together. Think about the disasters that have filled our news feeds. How, how can there be a seismic tweak that we can usher in so that our earth and all that is contained within it and that our, our space and, our, and our cre the creation that we are a part of is treated with tenderness and love and care. I, I wonder where we will be when social distancing from this global pandemic ends. I wonder if we may boldly usher in another seismic tweak to our story to bring love and justice to the realm. And because seasons change, they always have and they always will, and, and during this season of, of Lent, when we have this invitation to center ourselves, will we be allowed to be so centered that this season changes us and not just the season itself? As we are being centered, feel the hands of the potter gently, powerfully, Hold us together as we are shaped. Soon, 
Very soon, the ripples of God shaping us will extend to all generations. Just as Abraham was given the the faithfulness and the faith that led nations to become a part of God's realm and the ripples of those generations have come upon us. How, how will the ripples of our faith this Lenten season, seismic tweak or not, how, how will that affect the generation to come? Our story is a story of hope and goodness. And we are continually invited to be transformed by God's faithfulness and God's truth and God's love. Amen and amen. Incarnate One, in so many ways, we have learned to minimize our potential as individuals, a community, as people of faith. Letting others define our worth and capabilities, we deny our power. May your presence among us awaken and enliven all that you envision for us, that we may be faithful to you and the generations to come. Amen. Let us remember the witness, the faith, the righteousness of the saints who have come before us. If not for the ones who dreamed of justice, practiced courage, and nurtured love, what hope would we have? Through their legacies, we know the power of God. For this grace, let us bring our offering with thanks. Let us receive our blessing together. With faith, remember the good news. The Spirit of Christ accompanies us. This is not an abstract claim. This is a promise that God still takes on flesh. When we act out our sacred potential, Christ is alive in our depths, our flesh, our communities. Turning from evil's hopes of our complicity and complacency, let us go emboldened, encouraged, and assured the power of God lives in us. May it be so. Amen and amen. Amen.